I want to welcome you all again to the Baltimore Street Fair Museum. Just to tell you a little bit about the museum, we are an all-volunteer organization. We've been around since 1966. Uh, at one time, we were affiliated with uh, the group that spun off and started National Capital. And actually, we had all the DC and Baltimore equipment here in Baltimore in the mid 1960s. At one point, and then we came down here in uh, about 1968 and got this museum started. And we opened officially in 1970, and our very first car to turn the wheel here was that little orange one back there, 4533, which you'll get a chance to ride. That's one of our very old, early 20th century, 1904 vintage car. For many years, this one was our baby. It dates to 1944. It rolled out of the Pullman manufacturing plant in Worcester, Massachusetts at the height of World War II. It immediately went into service on just about every line that ran in Baltimore, and this car also has the great distinction of being the very last streetcar to turn a wheel in Baltimore in the very early morning hours of November 3rd, 1963, after a rowdy uh, all-night fan trip where my guess is most of the members were not entirely sober um, and were very sad to, to see the pole pulled for the very last time in those early morning hours as the number eight buses were already running the route that replaced them. Um, and the happy end to the story for this car was that it was not the favorite car to be saved. In fact, a lot of our early members really didn't think PCCs were all that worthwhile when you compared it to the older street cars like the Peter Witt and the old grill products. Mostly because in 1963, there were still a whole mess of these running all over the place. It would be like, kids today saying, well, why should we save the light rail? Well, you know, the first LRV just got saved by um, uh, railways to yesterday up in Orbisonia. Um, and I think that the first generation Kawasaki streetcars in Philadelphia, um, the Boeings out of places like Boston, you know, they're all getting old and they all have a lot of meaning for those that wrote them. And so my guess is that as my generation and the young kids that are showing up here that are 18 years old are, are going to take an interest even in the newer stuff. So we're all going to have to learn how to fix computers uh, in addition to uh, fixing uh, old controllers and, and non-solid state technology. Uh, a couple other interesting tidbits about this car is that part of the reason I'm talking is I'm waiting for the air to pump up. <laughs> um, this car has been in two movies. Uh, if any of you are fans of Barry Levinson, uh, Barry Levinson filmed two wonderful films in Baltimore that were very reminiscent of his childhood growing up here. The movies Avalon and Liberty Heights both featured scenes with this car. In fact, this car was featured very prominently in Liberty Heights. The two lead actors were sitting right in these seats right here for about a one minute scene as they were riding home on what they were trying to recreate as the number 32. The streetcar line, which ran out to Gwinn Oak Park in northwest Baltimore, was one of several amusement parks just like Glen Echo down your way. But it's amazing how the transit companies built amusement parks and collected money that in Baltimore went to a park tax to help build our beautiful park system. And one thing I love doing, and I'm sure you've all done it, you get old real estate ads for neighborhoods that sprouted up outside the inner core of the city. You know, places that were becoming the, the streetcar suburbs as they were referred to them. It's wonderful to see that a brand new daylight row house in 1920 was one block from the car line. Railroads have dealt with highways and competition for cars just as the streetcars did. Well, Henry Ford and GM and Ford and uh, Chrysler did not make the lives of the street railways easy. In the 1930s, many of the small town systems folded. World War II was one of the only reasons a lot of bigger systems even survived. And the way that they upgraded their equipment with these PCC cars kept them running well into the mid and tail end of the 20th century. I grew up in a streetcar family where it was not unusual in the 1930s for my mother, I'm sorry, my grandmother, to stand with a bag of sandwiches at the front door of her little row house in Highland Town. And when they heard the wheels screeching on the 26th and up at East Avenue and Eastern, she knew that the car would be a block from her house by the time she started walking down there. And she would bring a bag of sandwiches to my great uncle, who was a conductor on that line, and they knew which car he was on because it rang the bell three. And, they made the turn. and that's the kind of stuff they did. 
And, and that was sort of the, the landscape in which these cars operated, and I'm sure much was the same down in the great city of Washington, D.C. City cars were geared for about 45 miles an hour top speed. It was a fast car. I mean, you could probably feel on the, on the straightaway. I, I like to get up a little speed to pull everybody off. This thing moves. And, and they engineered this car in Brooklyn in the 1930s when the ERPCC was designing this car. And, and one of the neatest stories I heard that the ERPCC did, remember it's the Great Depression, but they amassed about $2 million to build the ultimate modern street car, which became this final production. And one of the things they wanted to figure out is how fast can you accelerate a streetcar without knocking standing passengers off their bikes. And so they literally had a platform on a, on, a, on a thing that could move on wheels tied to a rope, and they measured, diff and they, they paid people to stand on this platform holding onto a pole. And they did experiments where they would accelerate the platform and mark how fast could they accelerate it without knocking people over. <laughs> And they geared this car to accelerate at the maximum acceleration where you still wouldn't knock somebody over because they wanted to beat out the automobiles that would dart in front of them at red lights and make left-hand turns. There was no left-hand turn signals in the 1940s. Traffic signal technology was primitive. A lot of intersections were manually controlled. So cars, to make a left-hand turn, would jump in front of the streetcars, which were always in the middle. So if they got caught behind the car, usually they'd wait for the light to change, make the left against the light, and then the streetcar would have to wait for the light to change again and mess with the schedule. So one of the things the ERPCC said is we got to start drag racing all these eight-cylinder Chryslers that Detroit's putting out and beat them. And they did. This thing can take off like a rocket. It's electric. It doesn't have a transmission. So for that reason, this is a really fun car to operate. i got to tell you, it's so cool. So, any other questions? C145. It is a snow sweeper built by Brill, originally built as a plow in 1924, and it ran in the city of Philadelphia until the 1960s, at which time the Pittsburgh Railway streetcar system decided they needed some more snow sweepers, so they grabbed it and took it out to Pittsburgh where it lived for a few years, and then uh, it went back to Philly, and if anyone here is familiar with SEPTA, there was formerly a gentleman who we lost a few years ago named Bob Hughes, who was with the trolley division of SEPTA. Bob actually wanted to get this thing back in snow removal service as late as the early 2000s. He had a new roof put on it, he brought it up to Woodland. And then SEPTA management decided that they didn't want this old piece of junk sitting out on their property, so they put it out for bids along with every single existing PCC car on their property with the exception of the two of their overhead line cars, one of which did eventually go and we got it, although it is not working right now. So we ended up getting this car, regaging it to Baltimore's gauge, which is five foot four and a half inches width. We have the widest street railway gauge of any street railway system in the world. It runs, it actually removes snow. If any of you like YouTube, do a search C-145 Baltimore Streetcar Museum. There's at least three videos of this thing in action. Um, just about all of us here have purposely purchased four-wheel drive cars so that when the snow is as bad as you can get, you can come down here um, 
and watch this thing in action, and, and it is very clear. Um, so if you've never seen a snow sweeper do its thing, you're, you're missing out, so check it out. Um, we still use it for work service as well, um, and it's, it's one of the many pieces of Philadelphia equipment we have down here. This one survived and was actually used as a parade piece even as early as the 19-teens and 20s by the transit company. Hmm. They put these rubber tires on them, and we actually used it as a parade vehicle up until about 15 years ago when we realized that the lack of shock absorption was really doing a number on the old body. So we made a decision to take to retire it permanently from parade service and to actually restore it back to a flange vehicle that will run on rails pulled by a team of horses. Um, it's mm -hmm. in the queue to be restored. And you'll see one of the projects that's ahead of it. But it's in very good shape. It's undercover. Um, it's one of our one of our many many projects that we just always talk about and hopefully someday we'll get to. Well, it's usually pulled by two horses. A team of two horses. Yep. So two mm -hmm. horses presumably. Yep. Big big horses and it had a conductor mm -hmm. and a motorman and people would usually enter from the back, exit from the front, had no heat, uh, no electric, and it's <laughs> propane. Uh, it did have a colored clear story and one of the things that was unique to Baltimore is that the different routes in the early 20th century were color-coded based on the color of the glass and the clear story. So if you look around at our cars, you'll see 1164 has got pink, this one's got red, this one's green, 417 is green, so one of the ways you could easily figure out what route you needed to go, especially at night because they're always illuminated from the lights inside. Is that painted glass or was um, colored glass? No, they were colored glass. It's also seated glass. Yes, it is.